My name is Hilary Bassett. I'm the Executive Director of Greater Portland Landmarks, and I'd like to welcome all of you. Uh, as you know, Greater Portland Landmarks' mission is to preserve and revitalize Greater Portland's remarkable legacy of historic buildings, neighborhoods, landscapes, and parks. We have had a very busy year this year so far. We've been active in research, education, and advocacy. We've been recently working with leaders in the Woodford's Corner neighborhood to build awareness of the amazing historic buildings in the Forest Avenue area. And I'd like to invite you all to talk by Julie Larry, who's our Director of Advocacy, on the 27th at 6.30 in the Odd Fellows Building, which is that very interesting building with the clock tower right at Woodford's Corner. Uh, she will give a talk about the neighborhood, and then you'll have a chance to tour the building, a building that's not usually open to the public. So I invite you all to come next Wednesday, the 27th at 6.30. We'll have great refreshments, and we're partnering with the Friends of Woodford's Corner and the Odd Fellows, who are a fraternal organization who are working to restore the clock tower in that building. I'd also like to remind you, now that we're in the better weather, we hope, that the Portland Observatory will be opening soon on May, May 28th, Saturday, May 28th, Memorial Day weekend. And we're having a great time right now training our new crop of docents and getting ready for school tours uh, for that grand opening. Now, if you'd like to go to the observatory a lot, that's one of the benefits of memberships in Greater Portland Landmarks is free admission to the observatory. And so I'd like you all to invite you, if you aren't already a member, to join Greater Portland Landmarks. And there's information at the table when you checked in. I'd also like to thank, take this opportunity to thank the Portland Public Library for allowing us to use their auditorium, to CTN Channel 5, who is taping this presentation, and you can watch it on uh, CTN Channel 5, or if someone you know missed it, you can catch it later. I also would like to thank you all for, for making a donation to support the Portland Landers today for this lecture. And to introduce our staff, you met as you came in Alessa Wiley and Amanda Larson, who was staffing the admission table. And I also always like to bring up uh, Ruth Story, who is our volunteer extraordinaire. Ruth, every year, brings together a wonderful series of lectures for our Landmarks Lecture Series. I want to give Ruth a great hand. Our speaker tonight is Kathleen Howard Sutherland. She is the Associate Professor Emeritus of Political Science and Women's Studies at Bowling Green State University in Ohio, specializing in Middle East Studies. She re received her PhD in Middle East Studies and Political Science from Indiana University in Bloomington, and her BA from Western College for Women, which is now part of Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. She taught at the American University in Cairo, which is the city of her birth and longtime residence. Kathleen's publications focus on the role of women in public life in Egypt and Morocco, and she received a Fulbright Fellowship in Morocco. She joined the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Ali uh, faculty in 2005, and has taught courses on the Middle East, Islam, women, refugees, and Sub-Saharan Africa. She is the recipient in 2012 of the annual Beatrice Chapman Minot Award for Public Service, awarded by the World Affairs Council of Men, which she serves on the board. So she also has a very strong interest in women's history, and it's been really fun to get to know Kathleen as she's been poking around our archives and landmarks, asking me if I could give her phone numbers of people who still live in the greater Portland area who could give her first-hand accounts. And so I'm very delighted to be able to welcome today Kathleen Sutherland. Good evening. Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be with you this evening. When Ruth Story asked me some time, a year ago to uh, address this topic, I wondered whether she knew what she was doing. <laughs> um, because um, you know, my focus had been primarily in the Middle East. But in the Middle East, and specifically in Egypt, I was aware um, and I visited some of the sites that were being restored in Cairo. Um, and I recently 
checked up on it, and it's a fascinating story there. Uh, and I also have some main roots, uh, and I could tie those in somewhat with the <coughs> women I will be um, talking about this evening. Uh, one of them, uh, Edith Sills, who will be a major um, figure that I will be discussing this evening, um, was uh, living in her late teens, I believe, in Holton, Maine. Uh, as her father was um, the vicar of the Episcopal Church, Good Shepherd. Well, it so happened that some 60 <coughs> years later, uh, I was married in that church <laughs> for the first time. Um, and so that was a, a link. And um, my uh, former in-laws had settled in, um, in Damascata. Uh, the reason I was in Holton was that my father was president of uh, a small liberal arts college there, Rickard College. It has now succumbed to that wave of closings in the 70s. Uh, so uh, I also know something about uh, the life of a uh, president's wife, as my mother certainly played that role. Uh, as did Edith Sills. And so uh, I was really interested in delving into this subject, and um, it's been a fascinating journey, and I hope to continue it in, in some way. So what I thought I would do, and I, first I would like to apologize, of all things today, my computer crashed, <laughs> and I had a uh, PowerPoint presentation almost ready to present to you and it crashed. So you will have to wait on the pictures for some future day when I may be able to um, maybe print up an article on this. At any rate, let's try to uh, be uh, as much uh, visualize some of these um, women. Uh, what I'm going to do is to look uh, first at the uh, spark that prompted uh, a re recognition of the need for preservation of uh, Portland's um, historic landmarks. And then we'll take a historic approach to the, the precursors to the whole idea of saving uh, valuable architectural um, uh, buildings. Uh, and then we will uh, look at uh, what happened in 1961. Of course, the spark uh, that really ignited this, this interest, renewed concern over what was happening to Portland was that famous uh, demol demolition of uh, the Union Station um, Tower in 1961. And until that time, of course, you probably were that uh, Portland had been going through a urban renewal phase. Um, they had, uh, the economy had kind of suffered. They wanted to bring uh, tourism. And so the whole idea was to tear down things, uh, never mind their beauty. Uh, and in fact, many people didn't uh, see the beauty. Uh, old was passé. Uh, let's build something new and clean and, uh, well, uh, this was a big shock, as I'm sure many of you know um, and, and experienced uh, in 1961. So this prompted um, uh, Mrs. Sills uh, to call together a group of um, concerned citizens uh, and we'll talk about that to, to uh, see what could be done to uh, prevent further destruction. Okay, so let's see what uh, her ancestor, her precursors uh, had done in even going back to the 19th century. Well, um, have one major um, savior, saving um, uh, event 
was the preservation of Mount Vernon in, uh, in Virginia uh, by one Anne Pamela Cunningham. Um, this was in the 1830s, uh, 40s, 50s, uh, and her mother had been sailing right down the Potomac and had seen what a derelict uh, condition uh, Mount Vernon was at that time because um, the descendant of George Washington, um, Peter Augustine Washington, just didn't have the uh, money at that time or the will to do anything uh, to repair it. And so, uh, and how the mother uh, wrote to her daughter, Anne Pamela, uh, saying, you know, we've really got to do uh, something to repair, to restore Mount Vernon. And uh, she said, if the men don't seem to be interested in doing this, it is probably up to the women uh, to take responsibility. And so her daughter said, we'll do it. And she was a very shy person, but she was <coughs> determined, and she started a campaign around her friends, they were well-to-do, uh, to raise money to buy the property uh, and to um, uh, form an association which was called the Mount Vernon Ladies. Uh, and it is in existence today uh, and runs it. Um, and it was a fascinating uh, tale of the difficulty that they had in persuading our wonderful government uh, to uh, really uh, allow it to uh, be preserved, uh, to pr provide the legislation. Well, um, they did it. Uh, they paid two hundred some thousand dollars and they raised the money for this. Well, that was on the national scale. Um, and you also have another figure on the national scale, a uh, Susan Pringle Frost. Uh, any of you uh, have visited uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, apparently, um, she was a very key member of the community in the, uh, the late 19th century, early 20th century uh, to restore um, the downtown South, the Charleston, uh, South Carolina. And she was rather unique in the sense that she was brought up in you know, the traditional social, southern uh, household, women were to be uh, uh, at home uh, in conformity at that time to the Victorian uh, notion of motherhood uh, and the role of women. But she branched out and she became a real estate uh, developer and was very concerned and she mobilized uh, the community and she was also quite active in the suffrage movement. <coughs> Um, so that's another major figure, and that's important. She's important because uh, later uh, the sales committee then uh, contacted the preservation mission in Charleston for ideas on what could be done here. Um, well, let's look at the more local scene, and of course we have. Um, and Wadsworth Pierce, who uh, and you probably have known know her um, story. Uh, John Baben was very interesting in talking and writing about her in the, the book on Henry Wadsworth uh, Longfellow. Well, Anne was his younger sister, and she was she was born in eighteen. Um, and she uh, was married, she married uh, Henry's uh, classmate at Bowdoin, and it was part of the love story. He was a very accomplished uh, young uh, lawyer. Uh, this was in 1832, and um, 
that were very happy, moved out of the Walter Longfellow uh, home, where she had been very happy. It was a very happy home life. And she lived with um, uh, Pierce for three years, and then very sadly, he, he died of typhus. Uh, 1835, and she moved home and lived there for the rest of her life and uh, was very determined to maintain the house um, and uh, contributed to the upbringing of her uh, nieces. And it was interesting, she, she never remarried because apparently, uh, you know, um, George Washington Pierce was her big great love, and that was it. And she preferred to return home. And she was very concerned with uh, preserving the, the wonderful um, uh, home that had been developed. Uh, so in 1895, um, she was concerned about the surroundings being outside the house being uh, changed considerably. Um, and she bequeathed uh, the house to the Maine Historical Society uh, because although, of course, the city had uh, offered her uh, a fairly generous, I believe at that time, $25,000 for the house, but no way was she going to sell that. Uh, and so she, she bequeathed it to the Maine Historical Society, and I believe it was really so to uh, preserve that house as it had been. And um, you really should take a tour of, if you haven't done it already, I'm sure you have. So um, she represents a figure at the, on the local scene, very important in the idea of preserving um, the architecture and the uh, uh, the glories inside the, the house. Well, turning then further down the timeline, uh, you have the um, story of the Victoria Mansion, uh, which had been built by uh, Ruggles Morse in the uh, mid-19th century. Uh, and he then, um, he was a wealthy, uh, Tellier made his money in New Orleans um, and then came back, to, uh, built this fantastic uh, uh, Victorian structure um, and he uh, lived there in, in the summer and then he died uh, in the uh, early, late um, 1980s, 90s, early 90s. And his widow uh, then didn't want to live there alone. Uh, maybe she couldn't manage it, uh, maybe. And so she uh, sold it to the J.R. Libby family. And uh, J.R. Libby came to Portland from uh, Biddeford and uh, set up one of the first department stores in Portland. Uh, and they appreciated the, what had been put into the Victoria Mansion uh, and uh, used and kept all the uh, furnishings in it. Uh, there was some rearrangement, of course, uh, and they were able to do that uh, to, because they had five children. Um, and there were three daughters and two sons and it was a very lively uh, household, and Mrs. Holmes did a lot of uh, entertaining, a lot of music uh, was played there. Uh, they were very interested in art. And so uh, they lived there until uh, 1928. And then, of course, the, uh, the descendants lived in there until 1928. And then, of course, the Depression came. They left the house. And it was maintained by the custodians throughout the Depression, but uh, nothing really was done to it. Uh, then, of course, a, a big um, uh, 
wind st uh, storm had damaged the roof, and uh, they wanted apparently to uh, so they wanted to make turn it into um, a gas station, <laughs> tear it down. You know that's a wonderful. Uh, <laughs> So they really looked around for buyers, and I believe the uh, head of the main historical society at that time tried to find a buyer, but people, you know, it was a depression. Uh, people didn't have any money. Uh, well, fortunately, in 1940, um, Dr. William Holmes and his sister Clara Holmes uh, took up the, um, they looked at it, they wanted to retire, uh, or at least have it as a uh, home, and they, they uh, there were some people around who saw the possibilities of uh, preserving it. So uh, the homes, the brother and sister, bought the Victoria Mansion and then turned it over to what became the Victoria Society for uh, Women. Uh, it was to be used for as a cultural center uh, for the for these um, ladies who were very concerned about education, promoting education for women, and recognizing achievement of women in Maine. Uh, and they wanted a nice place to hold various uh, events there, which they they did. Uh, it's interesting that. Uh, Holmes, Dr. Holmes was an educator. His uh, sister, Clara Holmes, was an art historian, art teacher, and she uh, was rather quiet um, in terms of public um, uh, presence, but she was very active in determining the, and, uh, the uh, decoration, the restoration of the mansion in, inside. Um, we have um, Arlene Schwint was very kind in, in uh, showing me some of these uh, letters that she wrote uh, to the society saying, now uh, she was very particular about saying the color scheme and where the furniture should be and so forth. So, uh, and she uh, did say, Yes, it's a joint public, uh, project, uh, but um, it was Dr. Holmes really wanted me to, to take care of this, and I am very active, and I uh, and I will. I hope you will pay attention to my wishes. Uh, so she was very concerned about her own role, uh, but she don't have much biographical. Uh, uh, information on her. So uh, this was this was a uh, project that developed uh, through the 40s and continues on to today. And it's been a remarkable um, uh, project. Um, Arlene was saying that, and you can see it in the literature. 90% of the original uh, furniture. Uh, um, belongings uh, dating back to the Libby's and before have been restored uh, to the mansion. And it's been quite uh, a project uh, for her because she's been having to trace the uh, descendants, uh, and they had there were several <laughs> descendants trying to trace them and, and to get back the, these uh, uh, objects. So um, that is another more contemporary example of the concern that women have had in uh, restoring the architecture of, of, the, uh, of the Victorian mansion. Um, and it was very interesting, particularly at a time when the, uh, you know, the, the Depression, and then you had the war, uh, so it was, it was uh, difficult, but people were, at that time, uh, more and more interested, particularly uh, the women. Um, and the activities 
of the Victoria Society, I think you can say, overlapped into uh, the groundwork for uh, the later uh, developments after the tower was um, uh, destroyed. Uh, because, of course, this was in the 40s and the 50s, and then Portland was uh, going through a throes of economic uh, decline, uh, and you had uh, growing concern for urban renewal. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was um, the idea was to tear things down. We were having the uh, building of the arterial, uh, which split neighborhoods, uh, and there were other uh, problems in trying to restore what they were going to do with the old port. Uh, and then the, in the effort to build up tourism and so forth, you had the uh, appeal to, say, hotels. Well, the Holiday Inn um, was uh, made a proposal, but they insisted that, uh, this was later, but just to give you an example, um, uh, having the widening of Spring Street uh, and the tearing down of buildings, but that was, that came later. Uh, but the developers and the, the city fathers simply didn't care whether or not um, you preserved, say, the Union Station. Uh, but of course, the train service had declined, um, and the, the Union Station was just sitting there. And until later, uh, the 60s, 70s, there just wasn't this idea of um, restoring the uh, stations, you had this case in other cities too, of, uh, and making other use of these stations rather than just uh, uh, delivering and, and uh, sending away people on trains. Uh, so come um, 1961, you have the uh, tearing down all of a sudden uh, of the station. Now, I understand from uh, some uh, Pamela Plum perhaps, that figures like Edith Sills knew that this might be in the works. And she may well have tried on her own to put pressure on the city fathers. Uh, but that didn't work. And lo and behold, the 1961, the, the, the destruction of the bulldozers appeared and it went down. So uh, this was, as I mentioned earlier, a big shock. And uh, Edith Sills decided, okay, if I, she couldn't do it herself, she joint action had to be uh, made. And so she gathered together uh, a group uh, of leading in, uh, personalities in the city, uh, those who had influence, those who were concerned with art, with uh, architecture, and uh, she invited them for tea one afternoon and uh, uh, raise them, what are we going to do about it? Uh, and evidently, uh, if you, those of you who knew Edith Silver, you did not turn down an invitation to uh, the home to Edith Sills uh, uh, bidding. Um, so there were a few uh, well known individuals there. Um, let me talk first about the background of Edith Sills. Um, she was quite a um, uh, very forceful but very delightful uh, woman. Uh, 
Uh, she was very vivacious, apparently, and very cordial. And um, she had been educated in at Smith, uh, excuse me, Wellesley, Wellesley. Smith, they'll love you who are talking about This Smith branch was also very active. <laughs> so um, she uh, graduated in 1911 from uh, Wellesley and in classics. And she uh, then taught briefly in Holton and then Portland High School uh, in 1213. And she had a lot of connections in, from her Wellesley uh, uh, experience. And she happened to meet um, a fellow classics scholar who was at Bowdoin, that one Kenneth Sills, who was teaching at Bowdoin at that time, rose to be um, dean, um, and a courtship developed. Uh, it's interesting, they used to sometimes correspond in Greek and Latin. <laughs> Uh, from Washington. And those of you who have, uh, there's a very interesting book out uh, named Sills at Bowdoin. Um, and so courtship developed and she, uh, at that time she had gone down to New York to teach and to really get a master's degree. But um, they then, things proceeded and they got married in 1918. Uh, he was um, just appointed president of uh, Bowdoin, one of the youngest um, presidents, um, 39 at that time. And um, so she became a president's wife. Well, she threw herself into that uh, with Gusto, and she um, they, they did a lot of entertaining, and they decided to in, um, entertain every Bowdoin student with periodic uh, dinners, uh, teas. Uh, so they got to know the student body at that, that time. And uh, it was her mission to, uh, shall we say, socialize the young men at Bowdoin. Um, <laughs> And she brought out the best service, best ch uh, china, and silver. So they, they were uh, properly socialized. Um, and so her involvement in the uh, Bowdoin uh, camp life was very important because she developed many connections in that way. Um, she was, uh, she saw herself in the very um, concerned with the education also of women. Uh, she was very active in the AAUW uh, branch in Brunswick. Um, and she, they did a lot of traveling. Uh, and so her horizons certainly um, expanded. Uh, one very rather interesting sidelight to that. I came across um, in the collection, by the way, it's at uh, Bowdoin, the, the Sills collection. She wrote a paper, it was not published, uh, stating her anti-suffrage women position. And I was astounded at that, but yet, um, you had, at that time, uh, you had elite women both uh, for women's suffrage and against women's suffrage. Uh, you have to remember at that time that it was the um, golden uh, age and there was a rapid immigration from uh, people from Eastern Europe who uh, were not very, very educated at the time. And so there was um, some concern on the part of 
uh, women and others, please, as to the probably the eventual quality of the voters. <laughs> um, and so that that was, there was a movement. There were elite women who were for uh, suffrage, you know, and then also anti-suffrage. Uh, just to go back a little bit, um, uh, Margaret Jane uh, Mussey Sweat, in her uh, activities in the late 19th century, was in favor of <coughs> suffrage. Uh, and she had met um, Susan Anthony, uh, and she had established this little club um, called, called the Club Cobweb Club, uh, and they had papers read on different subjects. And apparently, she was for suffrage, but limited suffrage. <laughs> and to own, earn your voting privilege. Well, so. You had varying positions on that. Whether um, Edith Sills changed her position on this, uh, I, I have to read <coughs> more, but there was nothing more that I could see that showed that she had changed her position. On the other hand, she became very active in, as I said, AAUW, and then also the college club, once they came down to Portland after his retirement in 52, um, they, she was very active in, in college club and then she also was apparently president of the Wellesley Club and so she really established many different um, uh, connections and, and uh, uh, valuable connections. So she was able to um, well, on uh, count on uh, these connections to uh, push for preservation and uh, uh, preservation um, and preventing further destruction. Another key member of this group was Elizabeth Ring. Uh, some of you have may have gone to uh, Darien High School. Uh, in the 60s, um, she, she was taught at Derry High School from the 40s to 69. She also was basically <coughs> main history. Uh, she was born in 1902 uh, and graduated from uh, University of Maine in Orono, uh, 1923. And from then on, she really delved into history. She loved it, um, and she was totally devoted to it. Uh, she did teach uh, briefly at the University of Maine. Um, I understand that uh, she was kind of the victim at that time of uh, Orono. University of Maine uh, um, politics and the Home Economics de Department and History Department were um, fighting turf wars over whether or not she could be teaching in history. They want her in Home Economics. <laughs> <laughs> it tells you something about the role of women at that time in education. Uh, so she gave she escaped that um, and was able to come down here to teach in uh, the Portland High Schools. Uh, she was paid a little bit better. Uh, and she kind of concentrated on um, Maine history. She also was a beneficiary of the Depression area of WPA, where they created positions for academic jobless academicians to do uh, research on, uh, on uh, genealogy and, and getting records uh, straight. Um, and so she wrote, she really made a, uh, a study for the, Maine, for the state of Maine on the histories of, um, 
uh, main uh, families and she documented a, a great deal. So she also worked, she, she published a book on the progressive movement in um, the United States and Maine, in Maine. Um, and she worked all her life practically on the history of Maine and the making of the nation. Uh, it, it's a monumental work like that. And it's from 18, uh, 1880 to 1870. And uh, I understand that from, from some of her colleagues, uh, her problem was that she could never stop doing research. And she was always sticking in further information. <laughs> and uh, some people were afraid that she'd never publish it. Well, she finally did publish it shortly before her. Uh, she passed away. She also did a, wrote a very interesting work on the MacArthur's of Limington, which forms part of the, her major work. But it, it follows a family in the origins of the uh, uh, settlers in Lim Limington. So she had many uh, connections too, and she was able to <coughs> bring to this new, this civil committee, new blood uh, from among her students, one being Earl Shuttleworth. <laughs> and you probably know the story uh, which he shared with me um, uh, over the phone of how he was only 14 uh, in, in junior high school when she uh, learned about him from his sister, and he was really um, obsessed with history. Uh, very precocious, apparently he was 13 going on 50. Um, and so uh, she brought him to the, that first meeting of the civil committee at 14. <laughs> Uh, well, he continued, of course, with her, and she was apparently a fantastic teacher, really got students involved. She was a very um, uh, imposing uh, uh, figure, and yet very engaging, made you want to study uh, history, uh, made it really alive. And she assigned him as a class project to go around Portland uh, to um, and photograph buildings, and he did. Uh, and then he, she had him present his slide show uh, to the college club, and then also to the civil committee. And everyone was very impressed with it. And so he was launched on his career to um, be the state historian. So um, uh, she brought her academic skills, her historical skills, and her connections to the school to the working of the uh, Sills Committee. The Sills Committee met for two uh, years on a weekly basis uh, in Mrs. Sills' home. And then um, she, uh, she was getting older uh, at that time, that was incorporated into the Greater Portland Landmarks. Uh, and younger blood came in, um, and one of the uh, great forces, actually, in um, enabling Great Portland for Lennox to move on was working with the Junior League uh, in a project to restore the Howe House. Uh, and the, uh, they brought, uh, or the Junior League was comprised of women who <coughs> could not really work in, in the uh, professional world at that time. It was difficult. And they devoted themselves to voluntary work, and they really did push for um, projects such as the Greater Portland Landmarks. Uh, apparently, they take projects 
uh, on a limited basis every two years. Uh, and so you had um, young blood being brought in, and they funded the establishment of the hiring of an executive um, part-time executive director, who was uh, Pamela Plum. Uh, and Pamela, I'm running out of time here, but I just want Pamela Plum was came in uh, when one of the first major projects was moving the Gothic house from the site where the Holiday Inn uh, was being built. Um, and of course, the Holiday Inn had resisted uh, saving the Gothic house. I mean, it's not an old house. Uh, but finally, the Greater Portland Island persuaded them to at least save them. And they lost the other buildings on that on Spring Street. But um, they moved it. They found a buyer, uh, found a plot, and um, they moved it in 1971 uh, from Spring Street up to, further up Spring Street um, uh, near the cemetery. And there it stands uh, today. And the, I had a very um, interesting talk with its present owner, uh, Marta uh, Morse, um, who bought it from the, the Whipples who had bought it um, at the time that it was moved. Uh, it has a very interesting history, uh, which related to the the interaction, the connection uh, between <coughs> Scotland and Cuba uh, in the 19th century, uh, because the um, uh, owners, um, uh, Horatio Fox, the Fox family, had built it. Uh, uh, and, and also McClellan, they were tied together. And so um, it was uh, allowed to be preserved and restored, and it is it's there. And I it was a, it's, they've done a wonderful job in preserving the character inside, and so, while still modernizing it somewhat. Um, I've got 10 minutes, so um, I wanted to leave some time for uh, connections. I wanted, before I, I uh, open it up, I want to thank um, the various uh, institutions which have provided me uh, with information. Um, the University of New England uh, Women's Writers Collection is a very, uh, very useful for uh, these collections of, of memoirs of different uh, uh, important women. Um, also, the Maine Historical Society uh, has been very helpful in uh, the, the Elizabeth Ring uh, collection. And um, Bowdoin, of course, library has a collection of Edith the Sills collection. Uh, and I'm also very grateful to the um, Maine Historical Society for the uh, information on, uh, and John Bavin for information on, uh, and Longfellow um, Pierce. Uh, I, there are several other members who I should really mention. Apparently, Frances uh, Peabody was a very important figure. Uh, she had a connection with uh, the Junior League, but she also uh, was a member of the Colonial Dames. Uh, also, um, uh, Mary the, uh, Dodge was, had been very active in the Greater Portland Landmarks, <coughs> and she was telling me the other uh, day that uh, what the early members did was just going around canvassing uh, property uh, trying to see what was needed to get the uh, uh, landmarks to get on the ball and try to, to save these buildings. The whole idea is really to uh, encourage people to buy the property, but with a proviso of preserving the architectural value of 
beauty of these buildings. Um, so there, there are several other um, uh, people that I could mention. If I haven't mentioned someone, please speak up. <laughs> I'd be very happy to, to uh, know. Um, uh, I see Janet Hurt here, um, Lee, uh, Jane Hurt, um, and others. So please speak up if you have some questions. Any? Yes. I'm um, just curious during your uh, interviews and, and whatnot, did anyone ever mention the San Antonio uh, uh, Conservation Society? Because that was primarily uh, a woman led effort in the 1920s. That was, Which, what was the, the San Antonio Conservation Society? Oh, no, uh, thank you for mentioning it. No, I haven't. I mean, I, I've kind of focused. Um, on Portland, but that's a good point to, to because San Antonio has been uh, restored. And I just was curious whether any of the women that you had spoken to or, or had done research, if they knew about what was they, going on in San Antonio and used it as a, a means of ideas or wrote to anybody there and corresponded with them? They may have. Um, I know they did, they looked at, as I said, the Charleston. They had, there was a correspondence regarding Charleston, uh, South Carolina. But I, I not see the San Antonio one. That's a good point to check on. Eddie? Others? Yes. <laughs> uh, Second question. Um, I, was, I was also curious. I don't. I don't know much about the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act in 1906. Oh, yes. But I was curious whether does Ed, you know, all right, Muskie, uh, I think was a senator at the time. Yeah. And because he was very involved in the model cities, I didn't know whether he had a role in the 1966 well, act and whether that was prompted by anybody in Maine and any of his constituents here in Portland. Um. I, I think that certainly the preservation, they had uh, connections, uh, they did get uh, funding more from, from the federal government, eventually. Yeah, and probably that's another uh, uh, point. Yeah, anyway.
but more when men had become involved. So they had to be given the, the spark, the push. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I'd like to address that for a minute. I don't think you can overestimate uh, the impact of the Great Depression yeah. upon that kind of attitude toward historic preservation. Um, our parents, generally, at least my parents, or some of you, your grandparents, uh, were of that generation of uh, adult, middle-aged adult men at that time. Uh, my dad was uh, a very intelligent guy. Uh, he was a good citizen. Uh, he uh, participated in civic affairs in South Portland. Uh, I remember coming home uh, in uh, 1961, uh, or 60, probably only 62, and driving down St. John Street. And I thought, what on earth has been going on? He said, well, the train's not running anymore. So why would you keep it? Uh, it was a very utilitarian attitude. I, I think, and I find it very understandable. Uh, I'm an historian too. Uh, I uh, uh, got involved in historic preservation uh, in Connecticut, and not too long afterwards, in 1970, for about three years, trying to save uh, a mill town, or a segment of the town that was mill town, dating back to uh, 1820. And it was interesting. The family mansions, which are all over on a hill, of the owners. Some of you who know textiles may have heard of Cheney silks. Was that? Term. Yeah, we can. Say, we ought to save those. They they look nice. Okay. Then we got to the mill buildings. <laughs> oh, for God's sakes! <laughs> and, and there was no talk of reuse. The, the talk was demolition. Then we got to the workers' neighborhoods. You're out of your mind. <laughs> and uh, again, I do think it's that, you know, if it's not being optimally used, get rid of it. And I think a lot of that came out of the Great Depression for what that's. that's I'm glad you brought that up because. Uh, that is an important factor. But I think it's changed over the years. I know it oh, yes! Dramatically. <coughs> well, we're a new generation. Yes. Yeah. Well, my, one of my sons is an architectural historian, and he is in, at the University of Tennessee. And one of the reasons he took the job was that they were trying to restore downtown and he wanted to know what to tear down. Yeah. And he came in and he said, this is a, 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 an important building designed by an important architect, etc." And they listened to him. They said, well, what do we do with it? And that was repurposing. Yeah. And that's what changed that whole, we'll just get rid of it. Because they could see ways of repurposing the building and adding a little glamour to it. Uh, certainly, I think the, um, by the mid-70s, there was much more concern. Uh, and because the younger brother was coming in, and there was much more concern yeah. with the presentation. In the bicentennial. Aha, uh, yes, bicentennial mm -hmm. people started. And then also, as an example, um, the, the landmarks people could convince the city that it could be an advantage, a tax advantage, to restore. Mm -hmm. Ooh, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's go ahead and preserve, because maybe it'll bring in money. But that, was, that took time. Um, to to uh, convince, there was a period when there were 
the, the radicals in the landmarks were demonstrating and standing in front of the bulldozer and so forth. And apparently that was the case <coughs> of Carroll, um, for the Carroll Mansion. And they were buying, they wanted to preserve a, a building which was about to be torn down near 75 State Street you know, the, for a parking lot. And they demonstrated and some of them were, were um, arrested. But then they just, they kind of changed their tactics and their approach. And they were much more, you know, they quietly persuaded through dinners and seeing people to, at crucial uh, places at dinners, uh, which could influence uh, the city falls. So that was, yeah. I have told you, and I'm getting tired of hearing myself say it, so maybe this is the last time I'll tell people. I was one of several pre-teens, uh, oh, I'm not sure how old I was, who put pennies down on the track of the last passing of the, the last passenger train <coughs> into Portland. <laughs> and it was very ceremonious, very sad, and I think we were self-motivated. I mean, yeah. I don't think I, somebody had to take us, but um, <laughs> I don't think it was organized. Yeah. But it was sad. <coughs> Yes, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I want to thank everybody and thank you, Kathleen, for a very interesting talk. We look forward to the